I'm your cult boyfriend. My name is Zach. Today we're talking about Queen of the Damned, a 2002 film directed by Michael Reimer, starring Aaliyah, Stuart Townsend, and Marguerite Moreau, who are all just ridiculously, absurdly attractive. I'm not even going to be able to like contain myself. I just don't know what I'm going to do. The fact that there is an actual film where a sexy vampire comes out of hiding to front a new metal band and winds up awakening a demonic ancient Egyptian sex goddess gives me everything I need to face the day. Also, I wish I was in Lestat's new metal band. Those guys seemed like they were having a lot of fun. I'm jealous. Queen of the Damned has a... Uh, clearly, there's a lot of major problems with it, but I have a great deal of affection for it. I guess we could start off by talking about the Anne Rice vampire archetype. You know, either through the Vampire Chronicles, her books, which I've read quite a few of. I have never read Queen of the Damned, nor do I care about how accurate anything is. I, I don't really care uh, because I think that her like archetypal um, meanings were definitely translated into the Queen of the Damned film. So I really don't care how loyal it is to its source material. I feel that that is a uh, trap that a lot of um, a lot of viewers and critics alike get caught in um we should judge the film on its own merits really but um the Anne rice vampire the vampire is a very interesting metaphor figure symbol of course it started off in one way with bram stoker's dracula and uh i think nosferatu is, at least in cinema it's it's always been very interesting because there's that visual element that visual component um in Nosferatu the F.W. Murnau film the anti-semitism is unmistakable he appears as a Jewish caricature uh by the time that Bela Lugosi came around and kind of changed the horror landscape forever with his performance in Todd Browning's Dracula it was fear of the vaguely eastern European foreigner who was going to um sleep with our women take our virtue you know our innocence in a large way uh, the vampire would morph and change over time to reflect uh, current fears and, um, I think, erotic interests, right? Because Bela Lugosi was also pretty handsome, um, which follows suit because I think the next big interesting development within the vampire phenomena uh, within cinema would be done by people like Anne Rice, Neil Jordan, and uh, Joel Schumacher, and um, all, all, and, and films like The Lost Boys, Interview with the Vampire, books like Interview with the Vampire, The Vampire Lestat, and uh, Queen of the Damned, uh, and, uh, and other films as well, like uh, Fright Night is a very big one. Um, there was something wrong with our blood, and it was transferable, and vampires uh, symbolized a a more chaotic, self-destructive, and hedonistic, definitely nihilistic, alternative lifestyle that we were fascinated with. And we were also able to explore some homoerotic elements as well, because now these vampires were sexually ambiguous, uh, specifically in The Lost Boys interview with the vampire and Fright Night. Um, vampires took on a new kind of gay component to their... Uh, uh, to their physical poetry right this was during like the aids epidemic that's what i mean by there was something wrong with our blood and it was transferable and it would introduce you to a new and different and dangerous uh mode of living an alternate lifestyle so to speak Anne rice's vampires are fascinating i think that they're the most outwardly gay vampires um that that uh that have ever been written that have ever been filmed um they are also clearly the most nihilistic and in a lot of ways the most poetic, which also means that they're the most melodramatic vampires you will ever see. Uh, Stephanie Meyer's uh, vampires in Twilight are, are less melodramatic than the ones you will find in the novels of Anne Rice. Lestat, Louis, Marius, um, Armand, these are all extremely, extremely melodramatic vampires, and I love them for that. So this new vampire symbolism um, stayed with us until Twilight, actually. Twilight was the one that kind of um, morphed it into a more BDSM kind of thing. Twilight and the Vampire Diaries uh, uh, 
He even put in like a virginal quality to the vampires, which sounds like a contradiction, but Stephanie Meyer completely pulled it off. Um, Vampire Diaries went full Fifty Shades of Grey, which is fine. It's just really good and, and um, I think complicates the metaphor uh, in necessary ways. But uh, just before that, we did have Queen of the Damned in 2002. Queen of the Damned, I think, is very interesting. It, it explores um, the, the nihilistic depravity of Anne Rice's vampires. Um, it explores concepts of fame, um, the nihilistic underpinnings of fame. Uh, Lestat is on a suicide drive through this entire film. This film is about Lestat's um, endless quest for self-destruction, but he wants to find meaning first. He wants to die meaningfully, right? Um, but the only way to that he thinks he can really accomplish that is, I think, by his own death. But I think his greatest fear is, is dying meaninglessly because he looks around and sees everything as meaningless. Nihilism is abundant. Uh, but it is about his suicide drive. Queen of the Damned, he, he fronts this new metal band, as we've covered, which is so fucking crazy, right? Like, And I think that, uh, what, Jonathan Davis and Chester Bennington provide his vocals for him? <laughs> I mean, I think that's the funniest, wackiest shit ever, and I love it. Peak 2002, I love it to death, actually. It's really fun. Uh, I, I I like new metal, or at least like new horror, as we've covered. I mean, House on Haunted Hill, I think, is the best new horror film that, that was ever made, and Queen of the Damned is definitely following in Dark Castle Entertainment's footsteps, for sure. Uh, they even had that, that uh, the same tricky song that was played predominantly in... Um, 13 Ghosts is played in Queen of the Damned when um, when Marguerite Moreau's character first enters into the uh, uh, what the gentleman's arms, the admiral's arms. See, got that memory working again. But it's about Lestat's suicide drive. And I think that all of the 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 nihilism inherent within the, the, the symbolic meaning of the vampire is personified, embodied it's in, in Aaliyah. In Akasha, Akasha is the hyper personification of the suicide drive felt by young, sexually ambiguous, hedonistic, and certainly veering towards nihilism, right? Aaliyah is the most perfect person who could ever play this role. Yes, Akasha is the um, hyper personification of the dread of the suicide that all young, nihilistic, bi men um are looking for through drugs through fame through a certain amount of fortune by trying to establish their iconography they're actually trying to leave behind uh, a trail of breadcrumbs for death to finally find them and maybe through that sort of confrontation with them with death's death's hyper personification uh you can find some sort of meaning involved in that um, Aaliyah. Aaliyah is the reason why this film, why I consider it good, if not almost great. She was extraordinary. One of the sexiest women uh, ever to walk the earth. A goddess in her own right, fitting that she's playing a, a, a literal goddess, a, 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 an ancient queen. Um, and she really just took to this role. She seemed to revel in it and she was extraordinary to watch she um the scene of her dancing in the admiral's arms in that nightclub that i mentioned previously the scene of her dancing there it's it's more than just erotic it's ritualistic right um it's a modernization of the endless accomplishments of nihilism Seeing Aaliyah dance like that, covered in blood, lighting people on fire, tearing misguided, rebellious vampires apart, and smiling the entire time, as if those were offerings from some nihilistic void. Akasha is the hyper-personification of nihilism, and what's that? is calling to her, begging her to awaken. He, he, he hasn't forgotten his first taste of her when she was just this statue, when she was um, objectified, when she was just an object. And, but an object given um, a physical source of physicality for sure, and he drinks from the, from the marble statue of her. And 
it was enlightenment in the most grotesque way because from that point forward he was on this suicide drive this self-destructive mission to implode to self-immolate to die not without her kiss the warmth of nihilism itself so like when he sees her i think that he has already psychologically in his mind like when she shows up at his concert in death valley he's been calling to her through his lyrics and she does awaken and she does find him and I think when he sees her, he, he's mostly attracted to her because he desires his own death, his own suicide more than anything. He doesn't want to be a king because he understands uh, the benefits of, that are associated with being a king, you know, like being a rock star. Um, that was never truly the goal. It wasn't like fame. He is certainly narcissistic, but so are most nihilists. If you ever talk to one, they are extremely narcissistic people, but they are always described by their self-hate most predominantly, most, most um, infamously. Because if he sees her as a hyper-personification of his own desire to kill himself, then by sitting on the throne next to her, by becoming her king, he is becoming death, his own death married to the idea of his own suicide, making love to the hyper-personification of his own self-hate, having sex with the living embodiment of nihilism, sharing blood, fangs, needles, exchanging fluids with the hyper-personification of your own self-destruction. And that's what Akasha represents. And that's where the film finds its poetics, and it does have poetics. And those are fascinating things to like um, kind of explore through the film. I think the film is, I think it's very good. Anything that documents Aaliyah is very good. I, I've always had a huge crush on her. And here she gets to really, because like talking about Lestat kind of projecting all of his self-hate and self-destructive desires onto, um, onto Akasha. But uh, as a viewer, you should, you should do the same thing. Um, you should go into this film a thousand percent. You should go in too deep with this film, just like I do every time I watch it. When you see Akasha, I want you to project every kind of like almost romantic ideation or fantasy you've ever had about your own death onto this woman. And that's when the film gets truly complicated. That's when it gets truly interesting to grapple with and to uh, 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 try to feel because... Um, because Aaliyah takes on all, she, you project all of your self-hate onto Aaliyah and she, she reforms and shapes it into something entirely erotic and warlike, gory, visceral, palpable, sexy. I'm so happy that Aaliyah made this film. Because um, I think that this film definitely made her an icon within the horror genre. Um, I think she should be a lot more visible as an icon. I think that her face, um, Akasha's face, should be like everywhere. Um, I think it should be a lot more dominant in places where it's not. Because I think that uh, her performance here is like a gold mine of philosophy. A, a, a gold mine of... Um, The stuff that horror movie legends are made out of, she is extraordinary in this film. Lestat's fantasy of his, um, his erotic fantasy of his own death embodied by Akasha is, is now mine. Lestat has shared that with me, and I identify with that sort of morbid and sexy embodiment, hyper-personification, physical poetry of my own self-hate and my own longing for my own death. Kasha is the, is the queen of that very dark territory within my soul that is past the blues, that is a void. She rules over the void that exists inside of me, inside of all of us. She is the embodiment of all forms of self-destruction. And I loved her so much in this film. I thought Stuart Townsend was really good, too. I do think that Tom Cruise was incredible in Interview with the Vampire. But he wasn't, like, sexy, though. That's, like, the problem with him. You know, like an interview with the vampire, he is phenomenal, but he's a whiny little bitch. He's such a whiny little fucking 
pathetic creature. Um, Brad Pitt, Antonio Banderas, and Stephen Ray, I think, did incredible. I mean, Kirsten Dunst is, gives the best performance of Interview with the Vampire. I won't go too deeply into Interview with the Vampire. That should probably get its own video eventually because I think it's very, very, very good. I think it's phenomenal. But if we're just talking about performances of Lestat, um, comparing Tom Cruise and Stuart Townsend, I think that Stuart Townsend is a better Lestat, honestly. Um, I think he's a lot more compelling. And where a Tom Cruise characterization would seem whiny, uh, Stuart Townsend's um, is more um, contemplative. And I really appreciated that. I, I loved watching Stuart Townsend here. And I guess I like my Lestat <laughs> in new metal aesthetics. I think the film is designed interestingly. That, that's where you get a lot of the major problems. I don't feel like I have to go into the major problems. It's not like Queen of the Damned is considered to be some sort of masterpiece. Um, it's not. Uh, I personally, if I had anything to really just complain about my largest complaint would be how anticlimactic the climax can feel you know i wish it was more of a confrontation and i wish that um akasha put up a bit more of a struggle it, it felt a bit easy but um alia just pulled it off so well you know i i thought that every frame that that alia was in was electric was on fire you know, not a wasted frame on Aaliyah in this film. It's weird reading about it because her, her brother apparently came in and like dubbed over some of the lines that you couldn't understand through Aaliyah's uh, Egyptian accent that she was using for the role. And it's like, what? Why her brother? That's okay. Fine. Like, couldn't get. Okay. Well, I don't care. I don't care enough to look into it at all. <laughs> but, um,. It's also fascinating in that climax, though. Like, I complained about it being anticlimactic. That's one thing. It's also extremely powerful and morbid because when Aaliyah dies about, like, taking away... See, I'm saying Aaliyah now instead of Akasha, and I think that that's an extremely necessary and the most morbid part of uh, the character's death. When you take the last bit of blood away from her, she apparently, like, turns ashen stone and completely just deteriorates rapidly and you see her rib you see her skin just burn and turn to like this ash and like yeah like i said she's uh disintegrating uh, at a rapid speed and you even see her rib cage and her skeletons everything just like turned to fucking dust and it doesn't and it looks so fucking sad and tragic and massive it looks like the death of a goddess ought to look but Aaliyah had just died like less than a year before like she had just died and and we are watching her on the big screen die in a pretty massive sort of way like in a way that leaves nothing for the imagination um i thought that was interesting to do it's definitely morbid but a part of it does feel like closure at least for cinema's sake like it's weird like that should have a bit more discourse around it you know uh, I thought it was interesting that they did that uh, with Aaliyah's death. And this film is made in dedication to her. At the end, the first thing you see when the film ends is in, in loving memory of Aaliyah. And my God, this, is, this film treats her like the goddess that she was. You know, um, she looked divine. She looked, oh my God, I want her. I want her to dance with me, make out with me, rip out my heart and eat it in front of me. That's what I want. Why can't I get, why can't I get that in life? Why can't I get that? Where, where's my Akasha when I need her, you know? God, Aaliyah. Oh, my God. Fucking smoking hot, dude. Almost so hot it was distracting, but I think that was the point. So I'll allow it, for sure. I also enjoy that it's using the, um, the aesthetics, the tools of, of, of 2002 to make these nihilistic statements, these grand nihilistic statements. Um, I think that new metal is very capable as a genre of music to, um, to express these extremely self-destructive thoughts. Definitely helps when you have someone like Chester Bennington providing at least part of the vocals for 
for Lestat, considering that Chester Bennington took his own life. It, it adds like a sort of um, just like the morbid way that that we watched Akasha uh, deteriorate and die bef like before our eyes. Uh, that's adding a sort of morbid realism to it. Um, I just think the aesthetics of new metal, uh, they complemented um, the film's themes of nihilism and self-destruction and sex beautifully. I think it, it did it really well. And like misdirected anger. I thought it was really good. I like this movie. I don't know. I hope you like it too. In the comments, what do you think of this film?